Good morning, church. It's truly good to see everyone today. You know, there's been scores of books, and pamphlets, and articles, multitudes of seminars given on parenting and parent-child relationships. And no doubt, some of these are given simply for money. But then many are also given with good intentions. But it doesn't really matter how good the intentions were or how sincere these people may have been. None of these instructions can compare to the instructions given to us in the book of books. Now, of course, I don't think that the Bible is a manual on family living per se. But the commands and the instructions, the principles that are found therein, help to form the foundation upon which every house should be and can be established upon. Man doesn't have the wisdom to establish and to maintain an idealistic and happy home. In fact, the psalmist said long ago in Psalm 127 verse 1, except the Lord build the house they labor in vain that build it. No doubt, parenting is an emotional and difficult task. Just ask any parent. The parent is responsible to their children for many things. They're responsible for their material provisions, for their moral and ethical training, for their educational preparation, and for their spiritual and their secular upbringing. And a loving parent will do all that they can to fulfill all of these obligations. But even with the fulfillment of every parental responsibility, it's not a guarantee that that family is not going to have some problems, and maybe even some serious problems on top of that. Sometimes these dilemmas end with broken hearts, with shattered dreams, and yes, even disrupted homes. The story of the prodigal son is a constant reminder of adolescent immaturity and rebellion. I think every teenager who thinks that living at home is like being a prison and it restricts their freedom and their social life, they need to consider seriously this story of the prodigal son. In order to live better lives and to make wiser decisions, we need to learn from the lives of others and thus the purpose of this story of the prodigal son found in Luke chapter 15. Now the prodigal son is me mentioned among the trio of God's lost things. Whole chapter is dealing with the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost precious son. All were diligently sought for because all were looked upon as valuable by their owners. And although the preceding two were lost because of the negligence of the owners, this son in our parable wandered away aimlessly by himself. The term prodigal literally means wasteful. And it's certainly appropriate to this son because he was wasteful in every sense of the word. Now, when we first think of his wastefulness, we think about him wasting his money. While wasting his money, he certainly did show a lack of money management skills. And this usually happens when money is not earned, but it's simply given to you because you don't appreciate it if you didn't have to work for it. But he wasted more than that. He wasted all the words of wisdom that he received from his father in his younger years. And he only considered those words as nothing but foolish and old-fashioned sayings. One father said this long ago, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. This was the words of Solomon to his son in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 22. The young man in our parable willfully exchanged years of priceless wisdom that he got from his father for just a few days of supposed freedom and riotous living. But he also wasted the warmth and caring of family. 
for the coldness and the disrespect of strangers. <clears throat> the loss of family, of course, is disrupting to society, and it is very dangerous for our souls. This lack of natural affection is what led this young man to depend totally upon strangers who cared absolutely nothing for him. Now this boy, of course, he was sick of home. You know, the home is the greatest institution that man has ever known. The family is not just a means of just continuing the human race, but it's also intended to bring joy in the lives of every couple and of every child. The psalmist paints a beautiful picture of a family life when it describes its closeness in Psalm 128, verse 3. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. We need to realize that children are a blessing. And we should see that they are well provided for. Again, the psalmist said in Psalm 127, verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. I'm sure that the father in this parable cared tremendously for both sons, as most parents do. They love all of their children. Because one of the greatest blessings in life is actually to become a parent. It's what we all dream of. Cicero once asked, What gift has providence bestowed on man that is so dear to him as his children? The prodigal son had a great father because he made preparation for his future. This is not only the wise thing to do, but it's also the divine thing to do. In fact, listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. It says, The children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. This young man could ask for the inheritance that he had because his father provided for him. Now, there are several things that may have prompted this young man to have the attitude that he had. It could have been that he just had the attitude of a lot of young people. You know, oftentimes you hear impatient, disrespectful you saying, you know, I just can't wait till I'm grown up and I graduate from high school. I'm just going to blow this scene. Or they may even say, this place is nothing more than just a prison. You know, when I think about the troubles and the, the uh, problems that parents have to go through, especially when they have a runaway child, you know, I can only imagine the sorrow that this father had when his son ran away and went into a far country. Perhaps this son thought that he was just mature enough to make it on his own, that he did not need any more parental restraints. You know, some people are just like a young bird sometimes. They think that the first time they sprout feathers, that they're ready to soar off into a new life. And although this young son may have had all the physical attributes of an adult, he still does not have the wisdom and the understanding and the knowledge to be able to survive in the world by himself. Just like that weak, immature bird that falls to his death, so this a young child who is anxious to leave their parents prematurely, they will probably meet the same demise. But this young man may have also thought that his father was just too strict on him, and he wanted out. And it is sad that the world equates discipline to such things like hatred and coldness and abuse. But in spite of the objection that people have to discipline, Every life needs structure. If parents truly did love their children, they would discipline them. But if parents continue to close their eyes and fold their hands to their children's rebellion, then most, if not all, children are going to meet the same bitter fate as this prodigal son. Solomon said in Proverbs 19, 18, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Discipline helps children to avoid the pitfalls of life and also helps them to keep from having to experience further pitfalls later on in life. 
And believe me, those pitfalls later on in life are going to be a whole lot more severe than what they are having to suffer now. Those who hold with discipline or withhold discipline from their children are only paving the way for the children's ruin. Of course, we do have to be balanced in our discipline, else our children will become frustrated and they won't see any reason but to rebel. Again, we listen to the words of God through the Apostle Paul in Colossians 3.21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. But there's a third reason why this young man might have the attitude that he did, and that is because he really did not know what he wanted out of life. Maybe he couldn't envision himself doing the same thing that his father did, and that was actually working to make a living. It seems that he thought that he could live the rest of his life on the inheritance that he got from his father. But he later found out the hard way that money doesn't last forever, nor does it grow on trees. And due to his lack of wisdom in this area, he became very hungry. He would have eaten the very slop that he was having, having to feed those pigs. You know, Paul clearly said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, that if a man doesn't work, then neither should he eat. And this young man had to learn that lesson the very hard way. The prodigal son became sick of home for one reason or another. His leaving home with a negative attitude, uh, attitude of course, helped to lead to his shame and his destruction. Young people, before you ever live home, leave home, consider very seriously the successes and failures of life. And talk to your parents before you make the biggest mistake of your life. Remember, they have gone through pretty much the same experiences that you're about to experience. And they might be able to help you out with some wisdom that they had learned themselves. You know, home is more than just a four-walled structure. It's a place where people are concerned about the welfare one, for one another. And Sacrifices are made by all for the sacrifice of the whole family. One man once said, there's no place like home. Now our story says that this young man took his journey into a far country. And apparently this young man took this far journey to find himself. And there's a many a young person that feel like they cannot ever find themselves. They cannot make or recognize their personal identity unless they move miles and miles away from home. But this young man didn't just leave his father's house. He also left the core, he broke the cord of uh, morality when he left because it says he wasted his substance on riotous living. How many children do you know leave their parents' guidance, their, protect, uh, their protection? They forget the lessons that they were taught and they go out and do the exact opposite of what their parents desire and what's good for them. You know, Daniel was a great example of a youth who was taken captive into a far country, and yet he kept home and instructions in mind, as we see in Daniel 1, verse 8, and chapter 6, verse 10. But you know, while this young man of our parable was away, something unexpected happened. Great famine hit the land. He was now without money. He was alone in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. He found a citizen of that country who would actually take him in as a hired servant, but the job wasn't really that great. Here was a boy who probably never missed a meal in his life. <clears throat> and now he desired to eat the very food that he was having to feed the swine. Verse 16. And he wished somebody would give something to him to eat but no man gave to him. Can you imagine living in a country where no one really cares whether you eat or not? This once proud young man no longer had the luxury of choosing what he had to eat. And now he's wondering if he's going to get to eat at all. Now this rebellious son now longed for the sound of a familiar voice. This foreigner was in desperate need uh, a friend, someone who would stick with him through the toughest times. And I'm sure all of his party friends are gone by now. <clears throat> Solomon certainly spoke the truth when he said in Proverbs 19, verse 4, Wealth maketh many friends, 
but the poor is separated from his neighbor. We all have to accept the fact that money cannot buy true friends. In fact, Solomon said in Proverbs 17:17, 17, 17, friends loveth at all times, but purchased friends, they only last as long as the money lasts. What this young lad needed was the warmth and the care of family and true friends. But another thing that this displaced son longed for was for his father's advice. I'm sure he wished he could sit back on his father's knee again and listen to the wisdom of his father that he has shunned in his earlier years. <clears throat> but his determination to rid himself of that parental authority only landed him in the lap of uncaring heathen. You know, it would have been much easier if children would just heed their parents' advice because a lot of the instructions that they give comes from their own experiences. I remember the time, the first time I ever tried to clean my automatic 22 rifle. My dad was showing me what I had to do, gave me good instructions, and he told me, he says, son, whatever you do, when you take that action out of the gun, do not pull the trigger. I said, okay. I listened to everything he said. He walked out of my room. I got up and closed the door so he couldn't see. I just had to find out what was going to happen when I pulled that trigger. So I looked at that action and I turned it every angle I could, inspected it very carefully in case something moved, I could put it back. So I was looking at it real close and I pulled that trigger and a spring popped up and hit me between the eyes and bounced off in the carpet. It took me 30 minutes to find that tiny little spring, another 30 minutes to try to put it back in the way it was supposed to. When I finally got it all together and I found out that the gun was working again like it was supposed to, I finally told my father. He just laughed at me. The prodigal son would have done a lot better if he would have listened to his father's advice. Friends, we as Christians would do a whole lot better in life if we would just listen to the instructions of our loving Heavenly Father. The prodigal son now misses the respect that his father had for his flesh and blood. His new boss really doesn't care anything about his feelings, about his heritage, or about his welfare. All he cares about is that this young man does his job and that he does it right. All he cared about was what was going to benefit him. The moral of this story is that if you think that your parents are considerate of you and your needs and your dreams, just wait until you get out into the real world. Then the text says in verse 17, he came to himself. This statement suggests that he was not in his right mind. He had been devoid of rationality from the time that he packed his bags and ventured off into the wild blue yonder. But empty pockets, false friends, a growling stomach shocked him back into reality. His previously trained conscience was now beginning to torture him. And perhaps he saw for the first time what an ungrateful breath that he really was. I think it would do good for all of us to sometimes to seriously look into a mirror at ourselves and to see who we really are. After trying desperately to save face and make a go of it alone, he finally decided that he was in the wrong place and that he was now leading an empty life. Trying to make things up, he ceased to be the rebel of his days gone by. And he decided to go home to his father and throw himself upon his father's mercy. Now he knew what family and honor meant. When Christians rebel and they bring shame to their Father who is in heaven, we have to determine ourselves to return to Him and throw ourselves on the mercy of a loving Heavenly Father. Penniless and lonely, he makes his way back to his family. And it wasn't the cruelty of the world that actually drove him back, but it was the comforts and the love of home that beckoned to him. 
How many children search the world for peace and love and never really find it? You know, this lad had what most people uh, yearn for. He had a loving Heavenly Father, and he gave it all up. But upon his return, we notice something here in verse 20. The Father reached out to him. Our Father in Heaven is always waiting for our return with outstretched arms. You know, God asked Adam a question in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. He says, where art thou? Well, God knew where Adam was. So why did he ask such a question? Well, he wanted Adam to come to him. He wanted Adam to answer the question to make him realize that he was not with God, that he was separated from him because of his sin. When we do decide to return from our journey into that far country, God is always willing to receive us and he's willing to give us the royal treatment, just like the father in our parable. He gave a homecoming reception for his lost son. Even so, heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents, verse seven. But upon our return, as with the prodigal, some will refuse the penitent. And here I'm talking about the older brother here. Paul told the brethren at Corinth to confirm their love toward the penitent, that he may not be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. If we do not learn to forgive our brethren upon their repentance, Jesus made it very plain in Matthew 6, verse 15, that there will be no forgiveness for us. When people repent, they are to be forgiven because that's what God does. Now, the difficulties that the prodigal son encountered could have all been avoided if he would just given some attention to his father's advice. But the demoralizing experience itself was quite a character-building event for this young man. An immature child over a period of time actually matured both physically and mentally. An ungrateful inheritor learned to appreciate his father's determination to make provision for his own children. An unrestrained spendthrift soon learned that a fool and his money are soon parted. An estranged younger, youngster finally learned to develop a love for family. And an arrogant rebel had finally developed the humility that was needed for his deliverance. If we could just develop the same character that this prodigal son had, minus all of the mistakes and the errors, then God would certainly be happy and the angels in heaven would be rejoicing. But more than likely, that's not going to happen because we're told in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, there's nothing better than family. And there's nothing greater than the spiritual family of God. The only way we can enter into that family is the same way we enter into our physical families. We have to be born into that family. We have to be born of water and the Spirit, John chapter 3, verse 3 and 5. And if you haven't had that experience and you're not a member of God's family, we encourage you to do so. So there is nothing greater than family. And if you have not been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, to be added to the church by the Lord himself, added to that spiritual family, we encourage you to do that before it is eternally too late. But also think about this. If you're in the family and you have strayed away, you can always come home. God will be waiting with outstretched arms, but it has to be on his terms. You have to repent of your sins and you have to confess those sins as publicly as you made them. And then pray to God that he will forgive and he is faithful and he will forgive. But it's up to you to make that step. Remember the parable, the father didn't go to the son, the son had to come back to the father. 
and that's the way it is with us. If there's anything amiss in your life that needs to be taken care of, please take care of it. It's your decision. It's your step. Won't you take that step this morning? Won't you come while together we stand and sing?